I think that currently, and in the Canadian system, the system that was developed first in Saskatchewan and then across the country, that Medicare and public insurance of health care was originally defined as being uh, hospital services and doctor services principally, right? In other words, primary care and hospital services. And those two services largely are covered by taxation today. Both of those two services, right? They continue to be. Not, not 100%. Well, they, they do in this sense, that, that for the most part, um, the basic hospital services and the basic doctor services are covered. The question is coverage beyond that. Uh, there's a whole series of things that are co-pays, right? For example, long-term care. If you need to go into long-term care, or your mom or your dad or your family member needs to go into long-term care, there, in that case, it's subsidized by the public, usually, but a share of that is paid by the, by the person involved. Because the argument has been historically, right, that some of that is health care, right, and some of that is, uh, is beyond health care, it's living and living the, uh, the yeah. living mm -hmm. And if you were paying rent and you weren't going in there, you'd be paying those rents anyway. So there's an argument on that. Prescription drugs, which are a growing part of health care, have always only been partly covered, right? Yeah. And so this is where the issue of coverage comes in. And what we know is that those parts of health care that are covered by the public are not only the most accessible, meaning hospital care and primary care, but they're the most efficient. Hospital, uh, hospital expenditures as a share of expenditures have dropped from 40% of the health care budget to 28%. In other words, the public sector and the public process is more efficient. So not only is it the right thing to do, it's the, it's the right thing to do from an economic perspective. Okay, Adrian, if you had to answer this question in about 20 words or less to put it here at the bottom. See, at the bottom it says, add your choice. <laughs> if you had to add because you, you have a different wording and well, perhaps... Well, I, 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 I just say this, that I, I think public health care um, should be funded. There should be a number of things that we agree to that should be funded by the federal and provincial governments. Mm -hmm. But uh, public health care, things covered by the Canada Health Act, which, which mm -hmm. is a portion of health care costs, right? Mm -hmm. that those things covered by the Canada Health Act should be covered by the taxpayers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think what people are afraid of when they say, let's have it paid 100%, is because the erosion of the system goes little by little saying, well, maybe the meals in the hospital are going to be extra. Maybe right. the, the ambulance is going to be extra. Right. Maybe you have a tumor, but it's not cancerous, and uh, therefore it's not covered under the yeah, health and, act. And, therefore, and, and, and look, I think these, these issues are real. The, the government created the health authorities. The health authorities, the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, the Vancouver Island Health Authority, these health authorities, they're only the, 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 the administrative expression of government policy, right? They've, they've been created to deliver health services. They're government agencies. They report to the Minister of Health. The senior executives are appointed by the government. The boards are appointed by the government. The decisions about their budgets are made by the government. So these are government decisions, right? Public health care is defined by the Canada Health Act and the Medicare Protection Act in BC should be paid for by federal and provincial taxes. Accessibility and uh, the 100% accessibility would be if it's if Medicare is paid by taxes 100% and people just go to the hospital and get fixed, whatever your illness is. Uh, but we have the MSP and apparently the MSP uh, which is the health insurance plan of BC, is uh, the only one in Canada. Other provinces don't have it, apparently. And uh, it's uh, apparently a regressive form of tax, where the lower income people pay more than those who make a lot of money. Uh, what, what, uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on, on this issue? Well, our thoughts, the uh, Green Party of BC believes that we should have MSP or the, the health care services should be paid for within the tax system. And um, we ought not to be using MSP premiums as a way to make up for a deficit situation, which is what this government has decided to do. They've, they've lowered the escalation of uh, health care costs, but they said that they were going to increase MSP payments by 4%. And there was no logic to that. The, the minister himself said there was no logic to that. So the Green Party believes we should have our health care funded within the revenue system of the province. We shouldn't be charging fees uh, to individuals. And you're right, the, 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 
the, the MSP payments are, or premiums are regressive. If you have a low income as, at a certain level, you don't pay any MSP premiums and you get your services. But once you cross that threshold, which is still pretty low, and, and we're into the area of what we might call the working poor, mm -hmm. then, then it is very punitive to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, super wealthy. Yeah. <laughs> get away with the uh, same, yep. same uh, payments. Well, for, for MSP premiums, that's a regressive tax, right? So if you think about it, uh, okay, so for, well, first off, let's start with what, what is a progressive tax? Our income tax system is progressive because as you earn more income, the proportion of tax you pay relative to your income goes up. So as you earn more, you pay proportionally more. With a regressive tax, as you earn more, you pay proportionally less. MSP has fixed premiums that people pay uh, regardless of their income. So it, it, fa it makes up a larger proportion of a low income family's uh, income than it does of a higher income family. That's why it's called a regressive tax. And if you had uh, 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 paper service instead of uh, the tax supported system, would that be even more regressive? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, when you, uh, like in the States or in other countries that don't have uh, government paying for, for, for uh, health care, then uh, would that be even more aggressive because the individual would be hit with the full amount without... Well, uh, no, no, here, but here's the thing, though. When we talk about, or when I talk, when I talk about reforming health care, I'm talking about looking to countries that have universal portable health care. Right? So when I'm not talking about countries like the U.S. that have a significantly large uh, private uh, health care uh, sector. So if, if we're looking at other countries like Switzerland, Sweden, France, the Netherlands, where there is universal health care and there is a universal pot of money that helps fund that health care, that's a different story, right? What, what do you say to those who think that uh, uh, privatizing or uh, putting some... Uh, uh, user fees is a good incentive for people not to misuse the healthcare system, to abuse and misuse the healthcare system. Um, I think there is very little evidence that I have seen of this misuse. We rely on anecdotal evidence on stories about people misusing the system. But in reality, the largest cost drivers of our system are caring hospitals. And nobody goes to the hospital for fun to misuse the system. Mm. Um, so if we are going to put user fees, um, we will only discourage people from going to their family doctor early to get diagnosed early and treated in a way faster and cheaper way than if they were worried about finances, didn't go to the doctor, and then their condition deteriorated and now requires more expensive hospitalization. So I think these. It, it's not, a, I think that um, using incentives for patients um, or by privatization or charging fees is not going to lead to any significant savings because the most important or most expensive part of the system is in the hospital, which isn't something anyone abuses. Well, the, the argument goes that uh, people were using emergency rooms as uh, medic, uh, primary medic uh, calls, and, uh, and, and, and therefore, if you have a fee for, uh, for emergency, then uh, people wouldn't go to emergency. They'd probably go to a private doctor somewhere else. Again, nobody enjoys going to emergency. Um, usually, there's uh, very long wait times if, you, if you're not actually in a medical emergency. You're going for things that could be treated at the doctor's office. Um, nobody goes there for fun. We go there because there are no other options. There are no other options uh, in the public system. Uh, doctor's offices often, a lot of people don't have family doctors to begin with, so they, they don't have anywhere to go. Or doctor's offices have limited hours that they're open. There's nowhere to go at night for urgent care. So I think that if we want, we're worried about overuse of emergency rooms, we should put the conditions in place for people to have access to primary care doctors 24 seven, and then we'll see a natural drop because everyone prefers mm -hmm. to go to the family doctor mm -hmm. um, than to go wait five hours in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, absolutely. I think we need to think about what's included in our uh, healthcare coverage. We say that Canada has a public health care system, but really only about 70% of all healthcare spending is public spending and the other 30% is private spending. Mm -hmm. And about half of that comes from private insurance plans and the other half is out of pocket spending. Because um, a lot of parts of, of what we understand as healthcare are not actually covered by the Canadian uh, Medicare system. Things like dental care, vision care, um, drugs, prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the biggest um, items that, that private spending um, goes towards. And these items in many countries in the developed world are covered, at least to some extent, by the universal public system. So in fact, when you compare Canada with other um, developed countries in the OECD, uh, we have a uh, higher than average uh, proportion of private healthcare spending in the system mm -hmm. than other OECD countries. Uh, we have about 70% um, public healthcare coverage and the other 30% is private, while um, Scandinavian countries, for example, have about 85% of healthcare spending that's public and only 15% is private. Mm -hmm. and we, over the last 30 years or so, um, we have increased our reliance on private spending. It used to be in, in the mid 70s, about 23% of all healthcare spending was private, and now it's 30%. So it's slowly growing over time. Mm -hmm. And the biggest item that private healthcare spending grows is prescription drugs, um, dental care, vision care, and out of hospital institutions, things like um, long term care homes, for example, or uh, places where people go to um, do rehab or, say, hip surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're essential to healthcare. You can't really reject that, you know, having prescription drugs is an essential part of healthcare, and yet um, we don't have that covered, and there is evidence that um, ability to pay is actually a barrier in accessing drugs. If we do observe unequal access and we do observe a number of people who cannot afford to pay for their prescription drugs. Next question says, what does it include? When is healthcare constituted by? Right. Does it uh, comprehensive? It's very uh, prevalent here uh, with three, or three, at least three of them or four of them. They say comprehensive. That includes medical, dental, optical, psychiatric, um, prevention education. Most of them, they say that healthcare should be comprehensive. Yes. Yeah, the and vast majority. What, what do you think about that? that, and, that and, and I think, um, and what people call uh, comprehensive is different things, right? And, and, right. and this, this is always, there's always going to be a bit of a, a debate about this. I mean, but the majority includes sight yep. and, and, uh, and dental, which they are not included in the present uh, healthcare yeah, system. Yeah, I mean, sight is partially included and dental is partially included. Um, it's a main difference between the Canadian healthcare system and some of the European ones. So or, if you were if you were elected uh, and you became the minister of health, yeah. you would include all these uh, services that you're talking about. Well, I try and move forward. I mean, I think you got to you, you you have to put forward a plan before the election so that people understand what you want to add in that four years and what you don't. Yeah. And so I, I mean, would you we would want to we want to go in that direction, um, but overnight mm -hmm. to add add 100 percent comprehensive coverage of dental care. You, you wouldn't uh, would, do that. Well, I wouldn't do it yet. And why? Why? Because we don't have the money. Because because uh, you'd have to you'd have to. Uh, I think it's a more complicated process than that. You'd have to put it forward uh, and say how you're going to pay for it. Absolutely. Uh, the next uh, question is: uh, Should healthcare include dental and uh, and sight, which you were talking a little bit about it now? Uh, right now, as you know, dental is not properly covered by. Uh, the health insurance, neither is uh, sight or mental. Um, should all those things be included and, and uh, should it be a comprehensive coverage? Theoretically, I think that all aspects of health should be inc included within a, a single payer public health system. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly mental health has to be included within our health care system. We know that there's a tremendous lack of services to people who are having mental health issues. When we get into issues like 
vision care and dental care, mm -hmm. they're very, very expensive. And so before we add them in automatically, I think we need to look at the, the overall reform of the healthcare system to ensure that we're getting good value for the money for the current healthcare system. And then we can look at incrementally adding other services that may be necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, the government does provide um, dental services. I think it's $1,500 over a, a two-year period for low-income children, which allows them to get um, a, an examination done and a limited number of uh, cavities filled in that two-year period. So there are, there are strategies within the government which obviously recognize that if we want to have good dental health in our low-income children, they need to have the assistance of that being covered by the government. Mm -hmm. You mentioned children have that uh, privilege. How about uh, adult, poor adults? Yeah, exactly the same thing. We would need to we need to look at that, and I think that that w that might be one of the incremental things we could we could add to healthcare, the ability of low income people to have an assistance in getting good dental care, good vision care. Mm -hmm. So, what would specifically the Green Party do besides looking at it? Well, the Green Party believes we need some pretty profound rep reform of our health care system. And uh, that's the first place we would go is reforming the health care system. We believe that we need to make sure that we have good acute and hospital care, but we need to transition the bulk of our money into the management of, of chronic care in a preventive manner and health promotion to preserve pe people's health as long as possible so that they don't get into difficulty. We need to look at anti-poverty uh, measures. We need to look at uh, affordable housing and safe and healthy housing for people. Mm -hmm. So the Green Party believes that that's the first place we need to go. We also believe that there may be enough money in the healthcare system to do a better job of what we're doing without uh, continually escalating the costs of healthcare. So in the reform, that's the things we would look at. And then we would look at the services that need to be provided to have a more com complete healthcare system. Mm -hmm. I hear you saying that you will look into it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't hear any promises of uh, healthcare shall be comprehensive if the Greens are in power. Healthcare we'll will be comprehensive if the Greens are in power. 2010, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives published a study that outlines the economic arguments for pharmacare. Because often, when you talk to people about having a universal pharmacare program in Canada, they think that it will be prohibitively expensive. But in fact, the research shows that having a universal pharmacare program will save between five and $10 billion a year um, on our healthcare or drug spending you know, that we currently do on prescription drugs because it will allow the provinces to uh, negotiate prices with drug manufacturers as a group, as a you know, Canadian universal healthcare or pharmacare plan, and they'll be able to get better prices than they currently get when they negotiate separately. It will allow better regulations around uh, the length of patents for drugs or generic drug pricing. Um, another thing that the provincial government uh, can do to um, reduce healthcare cost increases over the long run is to invest more in uh, preventive and community care uh, options. Especially for seniors, we see a lack of community care and support for seniors to age in their homes. Um, home support, for example, is very medicalized. It's provided only if you have serious medical needs and uh, it leads to people deteriorating too much and having to go to the hospital because they fall and fracture their hip or in bed. And um, it increases costs in the hospital. If we put a little bit more money in this much cheaper way of providing care through home support and community services, people will be healthier longer, it will improve the health of the population, and it will save us money uh, from all these hospital visits that we currently um, have due to lack of care. So mm -hmm. another way where we can invest now in the mm -hmm. One last question. Drug addiction management. Do you think that uh, uh, the provision of drugs uh, should be on one hand legalized and the other hand 
the government should provide all those uh, illicit now drugs? Well, um, I wouldn't approach it by in the language that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. The yeah, Green Party does believe that cannabis should be legalized mm -hmm. and that it should the, the production, sale, and distribution should be controlled by the government mm -hmm. and taxed. Mm -hmm. That's a federal issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the power to do that in British Columbia. And so within our policy, we're saying that people who have problems with drugs those problems should be dealt with within the public health care system and not within the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So if a person has an addiction, we know there aren't services for those people who want to get clean and who want to be able to uh, increase their enjoyment of living. And so we need to provide those services in the health care system. We need, you know, arresting people and putting them in jail. Our jails are full of people with mental health issues and the Green Party doesn't think that that's a very effective way to deal with mental health. Harm reduction centers like uh, Insight and Vancouver, do you think uh, that is a federal thing again and would uh, provincial governments be able to influence or uh, lobby in favor or against uh, uh, harm reduction? Harm reduction strategies are provincial, so we've been to court. Insight has been approved by the, the highest court in, in Canada. So we could have safe injection sites in Victoria and in other communities in British Columbia. We need to have uh, needle exchanges that are fixed so people know where they can go to get fresh needles. That's only one aspect of harm reduction. And, and that is kind of a Band-Aid method that prevents people from dying. It's literally saving people from dying. This we is, we look at terrible. the last question, which is drugs. Yes. Drug addiction management. And uh, do you think that we have enough money there for, for uh, treatment and for, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, reduction, harm, harm reduction? No. Uh, uh, here's what we've done. And I, I agree with the safe injection sites. Mm -hmm. But a safe injection site without appropriate rehab services, which is what we have, right? What we have right now, they talk about pillars, but really the pillars we have is the enforcement side, um, which may or may not be adequate, right? Um, and we have, um, we have uh, the, uh, and we have a safe injection site process, which allows people to stay alive, but without adequate rehabilitation services, and we clearly don't have those. Right? We don't have adequate rehabilitation services. That's just, that's just a process for keeping people alive. And I, I think that we need, to, we need to emphasize, and it will pay off for us economically to do this as well. We need to emphasize rehabilitation in a way that we haven't done uh, to date. I don't favor, I'll say this bluntly, I don't favor the legalization of hard drugs like cocaine and heroin. I don't okay. favor it. Okay. I think it's terrible well, the, for people's health. Somebody I think said it's wrong for people's health. Soft drugs. And I think we should marijuana. We should we should advocate uh, we should advocate against that. In fact, they are first on the chopping block as soon as funding gets tied. These kind of community programs, access to mental health services, access to addictions counseling in the community gets cut, and they have been cut quite significantly over the last five years. Um, Jerry Parody. Um, was appointed as a provincial court judge here in British Columbia in 1975. And he served in the provincial court until 2003. And he, um, he dealt with probably over 1,000 drug cases. So this is someone who knows the system intimately. When he retired, um, he wrote a research paper called A Modest Proposal for a Sane Drug Policy. Um, so we're very um, th uh, lucky to have Jerry here today to talk about this issue from the point of view of law enforcement and what it means. Thank you very much, Libby. Thank you. Before I was appointed to the provincial court in 1975, I defended many people on drug charges. A number of them were addicts. The situation today may look bad, but consider how it was then. Heroin addicts, uh, very few had ever heard about cocaine, were literally hunted. They were considered not quite human by the police, by the public, and yes, uh, as often as not, by the courts. Undercover officers 
prowl the alleys of the downtown east side uh, using as bait the substance that these users couldn't do without. It's an old cliche, but it was like shooting ducks in a barrel. And the ducks that were shot in that barrel could expect no big break from the law, which more or less at that time dictated a jail sentence for simple possession of heroin. <clears throat> in fact, as I recall and as my notes tend to indicate, six months in jail was pretty much the average. And there was a very strange piece of work thinking that went into that. The thought was that that would give the sinner you know, time to repent and to get clean and then come out a new person and ready to become a productive member of society. That's a phrase that judges love to use. Of course, it, it wasn't really an idea. It was a rationalization because those like myself who were doing this had to somehow explain to ourselves why we were doing it. And we thought that that was a way to deal with the problem. Well, as we all know, that's not how it worked out. And also, we know now that there was never any chance that it would work out. Now, at the time, when I was first appointed, I bought into the orthodoxy that drugs, except of course for booze, were inherently evil and that this open season on users was the way to go. That the scourge could be banished uh, by punishing people who we considered, in a sense, morally degraded. Uh, thinking outside the box is another cliche, but there's a lot of truth behind it. We are often boxed in and conditioned by our upbringing, our education, and simply everything we read on a day-to-day -day basis. I was in that box for at least the first 10 years of my time as a judge, but sometime around the mid to late 80s, that drug orthodoxy lost its legitimacy for me. The broad public conception, in my view, of addiction has changed radically, and with that, there's been a significant shift in what to do about it. When I used to say, after I joined LEAP, that I didn't expect serious change in my lifetime, I don't say that anymore. I quite expect that there will be serious change in my lifetime. I expect to have a fairly long life, but I still think there's <laughs> gonna be some serious change. Insight is a very small first baby step in the right direction for Canada. <coughs> it's the most visible sign that there's a new orthodoxy out there at work. One which dictates an across-the-board public health approach to drug use and abuse. Now, it's interesting to note the constant undercurrent of righteousness. Now, that righteousness, that moral approach to the issue, comes down to a pretty simple sort of conclusion. They did it to themselves, so why give them any help? Of course, to be consistent, they would have to also eliminate treatment and palliative care for people dying of lung cancer after a lifetime of smoking. Of course, that's not in the cards. Thank <laughs> you.